All right, I guess we'll get started. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Mariusz Starzak, or call him Mario. Um, he's been visiting for the past two months uh, with the DTC Visitor pro um, Program, and uh, he will be um, talking to us today about some work that he did regarding um, convective structure uh, using mode and uh, some other object-based uh, algorithms that he wrote himself. Uh, his project is supposed to end um, at the end of this month, but he'll be writing his report shortly after that. Um, Mario joins us from the University of North Dakota. He's working on his PhD. His advisor is Gretchen Mullendor, and um, he's hoping to finish his PhD sometime in 2019, spring 2019. Um, still working on identifying the exact topic, but it's going to be looking at entrainment and detrainment in convective clouds. So with that, I will let Mario get going. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so thank you for having me and thank you everyone for showing up. The first thing I'd like to do is thank and acknowledge the DTC Visitor Program for hosting me here and supporting me for the past two months. So I can continue on some research that I started earlier on a couple of years ago and now actually being able to look more in depth into it. So like Tara mentioned, I'll be looking at identifying some forecast biases in regional or local simulations that we had in North Dakota and trying to look at convective structure using ref the reflectivity field. So I'm going to break this talk apart into like two sections. One is going to be a brief introduction to previous work that we looked at and using that previous work to kind of motivate what I'm doing now and kind of looking into some of the things we found now. Okay, so the original motivation when we started out was we, we had a bunch of three kilometer, one kilometer simulations that we had for uh, Western North Dakota and Eastern North Dakota region. And that was in support of field operations that we had and in support of forecasters in, in Western North Dakota that have a bunch of field campaigns they use for hail suppression that they use the forecast for. So first of all, we're giving these forecasts. We want to evaluate them and see how skillful are these forecasts and are there any forecast bias in the forecast that we generate. So we're giving these forecasts to forecasters. So are we correctly forecasting morphology, intensity, are we correctly forecasting the frequency of convection? And are there any regionally specific biases that we see in the region? So we're using the radar reflectivity field and simulator reflectivity field for verification of these convection allowing scale models, so three kilometer models primarily, uh, because convection has traditionally been verified using pre precipitation products. There are just a handful of studies that looked at other fields and reflectivity, but really precipitation is the result of convection. You can have the same precipitation field that is generated by different types of convection, just different intensities, different sizes across different time scales. And precipitation field is generally spatially or temporally average, which something reflectivity is not. Reflectivity gives you like a instantaneous information about convective structure that generates that piece of field. So we're gonna look at reflectivity through height. So so background, so the top right image is the western domain and the bottom right image is the eastern domain. So they're both pretty small domains, so we're not doing like a massive CONUS study, but they're pretty good domain sizes for sensitivity analysis if you have bulk data. So the western domain we had run starting from 2012 and they were across four months from the summer, June through usually September. And like I mentioned, they're used for operations and field, by, field work by state forecasters. And that's primarily the domain I'll be focusing on, that three kilometer domain in there. Although I'll mention the eastern domain because that's where our, a lot of the previous results came to motivate that study. So our model simulations are three kilometer forecasts. They're initialized at 12 and zero UTC daily. I'll be just looking at the zero UTC forecasts. We use like the NAM 40 kilometer for initial conditions, a lot of boundary conditions. And these forecasts run out to 48 hours. And just some vertical, 45 vertical levels for some resolution sense there. So this is an overview of the simulations on the left. Uh, all physics are the same throughout the simulations except what's noted there, which is the resolution changes, version changes, and microphysical changes, but all the other physics are the same. So we start out with the eastern simulations in 2010, 2012, and we verified 3 kilometer version 3.11 WSM6. So we moved that to western in 2012, where we started forecasting for, this, for the state forecasters to see if the bias that we found are the same in that same region of the state. So we started in a smaller local cluster, and then through time, as we got more computational resources and better at basically generating these forecasts quicker, we added on different, different members, testing different sensitivities to 
resolutions, microphysics, so forth. So right now I'll just do a couple slides about the previous work, which is more in-depth analysis of the 3.1.1 runs, and I'll also show Eastern simulations that use exactly the same thing, just to show if there's a difference between regions. And then the bottom runs, which are WSM6, Thompson, the Thompson aerosol layer scheme. I'll show analysis later on, which is what I've been working on in my visit here. So for the actual model validation, I'm comparing uh, one kilometer simulator reflectivity to one kilometer AGL radar reflectivity above ground level. And we're doing hour hourly comparisons from six UTC, so six, six valid forecast time out to 24 hours. So when we did this initially, we verified across two C-band radars that we had in the western part of the state and one C-band, which is the UND research radar in the eastern domain. So we constrained all simulations to match the temporal and spatial availability of radar data. So we only verified the models when we had radar data present that hour, and we constrained it to the scale of the radar. So basically, obviously radar degrades resolution with distance, and then you have other, all sorts of other issues with distance. So we cut the model domain down to match the radar, like the image in the bottom right. And we used the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation, or mode, to generate objects or regions of interest. And for the purpose of this study, regions of interest are defined as uh, discrete cells or regions that are above 5, 30, or 45 dBZ. So we checked three different thresholds for reflectivity. And that's an image on the bottom left there. We have a sample mode image of reflectivity, and then some objects that it generated, and then the object labels on the bottom left. And we didn't use matching or merging, but we just used the raw object attributes, such as counts, area, and information like that. So if you look at the eastern domain, so this is actually a sum of two different summers, 2010, 2012. You have the number of objects on the y-axis, which are binned according to different areas. So depending on which area they are, they're put in a different bin. So if you look at the solid bar, that's actually the forecast. And the hashed bar is the observations. So if you look at this first column right here, you can see that the solid bar, the forecast over forecasted by about 500 objects at the green, 5 dBZ. And then if you go to yellow, that's 30 dBZ. So we see, again, over forecasting, but by a less margin. And then at 45 dBZ, the red. So if you actually start looking across all these different area bins, you actually see a pattern that the forecast generated too many weak objects. So at 5 dBZ, the solid bars are much, they have much more objects than the hash bars. And this is like, true across all bins. And if you look at 45 dBZ, which is the more intense convection, we see that the forecast also over-intensified convection everywhere because they have more 45 dBZ objects across all bins. So essentially, the takeaway from here is the forecast over-forecasted object counts across all intensity and all sizes, so at 530 and 45 dBZ. Now, if you look at Western Domain, so basically the same thing is true except for the first bin. So if you look at the first air bin here, you see a lot of uh, 1 to 45 kilometer objects, but that's actually noise from the radar. Unfortunately, the C-band radar sometimes had ducting issues and hit the ground, so that's all noise. So, unfortunately, we have to hide that and pretend it's not there for these purposes. But other than that, the simulations pretty much perform the same way, generally over forecasting of all objects across all sizes and intensities, but they did perform better, especially for 30 dBZ. I mean, the differences are pretty slim at these scales. So, one of the other things we looked at was actually find the difference in aerial coverage. So how much area did the model forecast versus how much area did we observe? So we matched up forecasts and observations at each time. So each hour we had data, we matched it up. And we found the difference in aerial coverage between the forecasts and the observations. So this is kind of like the absolute value. So it's the difference in aerial coverage between the two. So we found that if you look at uh, 5, 30, or 45 dBZ, especially at 5 dBZ, generally forecasts are within 10% coverage of the radar 88% of the time. So that's pretty good statistics. Your aerial coverage is pretty well. Uh, this was not true for the eastern domain. It was much worse for the eastern domain, but same general conclusions. But when we actually compared each time and said, well, did the forecast have more area than the observations, or did the observations have more area? They're just within a difference. We found that forecasts overpredicted the area three times more often than observation than under forecasting the area. So that's an interesting statistics. And when you're comparing average object areas, the forecast had much bigger objects on average than what we actually observed. 
So using just those few statistics, we tried to analyze where are these biases coming from. So we tried to do a sensitivity analysis, and we looked into what could be potentially contributing these biases. So we're not saying that you tweak one parameter and this change the object this much, so that must be the solution. We're just looking at to attribute uncertainty. So if you just switch resolution, how much uncertainty are you adding to the forecast? If you change microphysical scheme, how much different is that? So trying to get a sense of what changes. So we look at different resolutions. We went through 9 kilometers, 3 kilometers, 1 kilometers, and 333 meters. In microphysical schemes, we went from WSM6, which is our control. We switched to the Thomson. And microphysical parameters, we looked at a lot of different parameters initially. But we ended up focusing on the cloud droplet concentration, simply because of the field campaign that we had in eastern North Dakota focused on very shallow conve convection. We had lots of observations, such as cloud uh, droplet concentrations, CCN, aerosol particles. So we, using that field campaign, all the data taken from it, we also observed a large availability. So generally, models, uh, at least bulk single moment microphysical schemes, assume a constant cloud droplet concentration everywhere, and that's always continuous. They generally use 100 for maritime, 300 for continental. But we observe a huge variability going up to even 1,000 or 1,200. So we want to see how the scale of that works when we put it into the model. So how much variability is it just by switching that? So once we put it into WSM6, we found that forecast scale is strongly tied to just that one variable. And object areas and counts were the most influenced by just changing the cloud droplet concentration over to observations. So I'll just demonstrate an example here, which is the August 8th. 2012 case that we looked at, and we'll have the high CDC case of 600 cloud droplets per, comp per cubic centimeter down to the control and to the low CDC. So the high CDC case was actually the observations we observed that day. So it's all scattered sh uh, shallow convection, so it's mostly below the melting layer, just a little bit of ice present. So this is a time series of objects across that day. So what we observed by radar is actually this black dashed line here and the solid black line is our control. So generally, the control actually did pretty well in forecast number of objects, but it was seemed to have an offset in time a little bit further in the day. So if we uh, drop the cloud drop the concentration to lower valleys, like more maritime, that generated more objects. And while increasing it, it cut the number of objects pretty significantly, so reducing them. So it's a decent change. But if we look in how much area changed across that day, this is where the real impact happened. So you have aerial coverage on the y-axis and the different times across time on the x-axis. So the control, the solid black line, already over-forecasted area pretty significantly for this day. But by lowering the CDC to, like, to 100, the area actually was almost six times greater than that of what was observed. While in the contrast, when you raised it, the cloud drop concentration to observed values, it actually did improve the area bias, but still overdoing the area. But that's a very high sensitivity that we observed. So looking into why is this the case, so this is like a simple model of the WSM6 autoconversion. And you have the autoconversion uh, rate on the left and the different cloud water mixing ratio on the right. So autoconversion basically deals with taking cloud water and converting it to rain within the model. So you have different, each, each of these lines represent different cloud droplet concentrations. So the first, the blackish gray line is 50, and then you go down to the yellow, which is 100, then 300, and so on and so forth. They kind of converge there. So the rate is inversely proportional to the cloud droplet concentration. So what does this mean? So if you have like 50 or 100 cloud droplet, uh, 50 or 100 cloud droplet concentration, that's more clean maritime air. So you have, you generally assume less, bigger drops, so there's less or I mean, there's less drops that are bigger, so there's less competition for water vapor, so they'll rain out faster, hence the greater rate. And the opposite is true for a higher concentration. So there's more rain generation at lower values. Now if you look closer in this part, the bottom, the lower cloud mixing ratios, uh, WSM6 actually uses a step function to start generating rain. So for example, uh, at a cloud drop concentration of 300, so this line here, you actually need a cloud water mixing ratio of 0.6 grams per kilogram to actually start generating rain. So essentially more cloud water is required for auto conversion with increasing CDC. So all this is fine, but what does this really mean for a forecasting perspective, for actual sk forecast skill? So this is a scenario that we have of auto conversion from cloud water to cloud rain for storm cells. So this is just a cross section, a horizontal cross section, a well, XY cross section. <coughs> 
And on the left, we have lower cloud droplet concentrations. And on the right, we have higher cloud droplet concentrations. So these just show different cloud water mixing ratios. So if we assume a low number of 100 on the left and a high, higher value of 1,000 on the right, we have different critical activation ratios of 0.25 and then 1.7. So when you actually start producing rain, which obviously generates a uh, radar reflectivity factor, for the low CC case, we activate both cells to start producing rain, and every, all the other microphysics take over, whatever's going on in there. And we have large areas. For the high CDC case, only the central region will be activated. So we start with the only one object, and it's much smaller. So this kind of explains the decrease in object counts when you increase the, the cloud drop concentration to higher values. Well, if you have a too low, then you add objects and you expand their area, so it's kind of like a double up on the area issue. So that's just uh, looking to one sensitivity. So really, that was looking at one fe uh, reflectivity field at one kilometer and analyzing some sensitivities. But we want to expand this methodology. And we want to uh, look into the 3D fields, because 2D fields are limited. We evaluated one height, but what, are those biases true at higher heights? If we go up to three, four, five kilometers, do those biases still exist? So this is where reflectivity can provide vertical information. So if you remember that table from early on, we updated the WARF model to version 3.7, which PSU is 3.1. So just strictly from a forecasting perspective, have these biases changed significantly between versions? If a forecaster looks at 3.1 and 3.7, should they expect the same things to be present, or are they changed? And is our analysis of the 3.1.1 run still applicable? The other thing is, the sensitivity we just investigated was for cloud droplet concentrations. But does the Thompson aerosol aware scheme perform differently since that's supposed to, I believe, explicitly nucleate aerosols into and form cloud droplets? So is there a difference to that since we saw high sensitivity? And the next step is, well, we have all, the, all these simulations, but how do they perform to operational models? Is there even value of us running these schemes, or should we just use the HER, for example? So we'll add in the HER to check that. And lastly, we need to verify simulations against the more accessible data set. So we had two, two C-bands that we verified against, but nobody really has access to these C-bands. We want to make this applicable to the next RAD network and maybe apply this to CONUS or other regions so you could study regional variability. But there are some significant challenges and limitations that come along with that. So for this portion, for validation methods, so the simulations are compared against the KBIS Bismarck and KMBX Minot radars. So so on the top right, that's the actual model domain, and the radars are noted with those black circles. So our primary evaluation height, so the evaluation height that we're verifying first and generating all our objects, is at two kilometers. And we moved up from one because one kilometer is just spatially limiting. I mean, one kilometer within a radar is just a small little circle around it. So if the forecast is incorrect, the timing, you're going to miss everything completely. And all the data outside is two kilometer height is filtered. So where the base elevation scan goes above two kilometers, we can't use that because we don't see below it, so we just filter that out. So that's that uh, black circle around here. Uh, so again, simulations are constrained to the availability of the radar data, both spatially and temporally. So don't, simulations are only verified within these black circles here. And lastly, when we look through height, there's another problem with the radar data that's called the cone of silence. So the highest. Uh, altitude beam for a precipitation scan from radar, I believe, is 19.5 degrees. So when you go up, you have this cone where you have no data above you. So that cone is actually filtered out as well, depending on which height we're analyzing. So it kind of expands as we're looking up, because we want to get the whole object from bottom to top. So normally you say your study limitations at the end, but I kind of want to introduce them early on, because this actually plays a role in how we verify things right now. So uh, there's a lot of artifacts and clutter in the next red data. If anyone's going to look at that reflectivity, it's messy. So the top right image here shows the frequency of grid squares uh, exceeding 5 dBZ within the radar donuts, or radar 8, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, so all these little red dots, which is your eyes probably draw to right away, are about two to three times, occur two to three times more often than the background state. So when you actually put these radars on the map, you see that there's a little ridge here, or increased elevation. Yes, North Dakota has elevation. So that's what the ridge little shows up here. And to make things worse, this little dark red dot here, that's actually a wind farm that you put on top of the ridge. So that's what shows up. And you see other wind farms here and there. And then, due to ducting overnight hours, you actually hit another mountain down here, which is this feature. So 
moving on to applying this to next right data is going to be a challenge, but I think it's still worthwhile, which hopefully I'll be able to show here. And there's also sort of other issues, calibration issues in radar. You have to interpolate the radar data to the model grid, which obviously adds some uncertainty. And there's resolution and beam broadening issues. So the last slide before results is the data availability. So our five local simulations are shown here and followed by the HER and the different radars. And the length of the, that bar basically represents each hour from 0 UTC June 1st to 0 UTC October 1st, the entire four month period that we're analyzing. So our, simula our simulations, the 311 WSM-6 and Thompson and Thompson Aerosolware had, were available the whole time. The HER had some more limited times and a lot more downtime. So initially we wanted to use the 0Z initialization of the HER and go out to 24 hours, but for at least half of the period, the between about 15 and 24 hour period was missing between the HER. So we were forced to use two initializations, one at 0Z and one at 12Z, and they just go out 3 to 15 hours and 3 to 15 hours for each. But in the end, I mean, if you combine all this data and filter the model down, we're analyzing a period that's about 71% of four months, so that's still pretty good. Uh, and we're using single, we're using merged radars when we can, but if not, we're using single radars because other than that, we'll cut our data availability to half. So it is what it is at this point. <laughs> so first plot, also the busiest plot, so I apologize, but we have the number of five DBZ objects across time on top and the 30 DBZ number of objects across time in the middle and then 45 on the bottom. So First of all, the observations are in black, and you see that I cut off the early hours and the later hours. And that is because of all the clutter at nighttime. The abducting from the radar hits the ground, and it's unusable at this point. But the diurnal cycle is, is relatively clear. The HER is in green, the WSM-6 runs are in blue, and Thompson in red. Uh, so first comparing just to observations at 5 dBZ, the Thompson red ones and the HER in green all did fairly well compared to other periods while WSM-6 really uh, generated too many weak cells, so it really overrepresented the diurnal cycle in this case for 5 dBZ. If we move to 30 dBZ, this time, and 45 dBZ, uh, the number of objects in all models is severely too high compared to the observation, so convection was generally too intense in the simulations, which is something we've also seen in our previous results. If you compare versions, so now it's the solid uh, lines versus the dashed lines, dashed being versions 3.11, solid lines being 3.7, there's really no significant difference between versions. So yes, for 5 dBZ, you have more objects that are generated by 3.11, but really the difference is not that significant. And as you go further on, you see that they're almost identical. And the same thing is true for Thompson. So I, if that's good or bad, it's good that they're the same, but it's kind of bad that they still have the same issue present. Did notice that the herd diurnal peak is one hour earlier, but no more analysis came into that. It's just some observations for now. And all models generally perform similar at 30, 30 dBZ and 45, so all of these are pretty much the same. So if we move on and actually look at the number of objects through height, so I'm not showing 5 dBZ because of the noise, but 30 and 45 dBZ are pretty much noise free at this point from the radar data. So again, the same colors represent the same data sets. The black line represents the observations, red Thompson, blue WSN6. So analyzing both 30 dBZ on the left and 45 dBZ on the right, we still see that models generate too many objects at all heights. So that's still true regardless of height. And the largest difference is at 3 kilometer AGL, so this spike, which 3 kilometers AGL was a very pronounced right band area. There's no major changes between versions except the Thompson at 45 dBZ, which actually the older versions seem to line up better with the observations. But you can't really say anything until you look at the area, which is still, I guess, a work in progress. So the, the next step would be actually to look at contoured frequency by altitude diagrams. So if anyone's not familiar with these, you're essentially generate looking at the distribution of reflectivity with height and now we're going to do it within the model and within the observations so how often certain reflectivity occurs and normally you do that in the entire domain so if you imagine that whole 3d box being your whole model domain but in this case we're only interested about what's causing precipitation near the surface so we're generating objects at two kilometers and then we're essentially oops, excuse me, looking up through height in those two kilometers so looking at different levels as we go along 
and only 6 and 12 is shown we're actually analyzing all levels in between. So we're looking at the CFADs in there. So essentially, again, just looking at the distribution of reflectivity occurring with height within the objects right at the bottom, you're looking through the entire column. And right now, it's just a bulk analysis of the vertical structure, but eventually we want to parse by size and maybe parse by time to pick up different diurnal cycle differently. So uh, these are the plots of the CFADs. These are generated for uh, two kilometer objects at 30 dBZ. So you have WSM6, uh, version 3.7 on the top left, Thompson 3.7 on the top right, and the HER, which I should have mentioned was version 2, the experimental version, which also has the aerosol wear scheme on the bottom left. And you have radar observations bottom right. So the first, so actually I should, if anyone's not familiar, we have reflectivity plotted on the x-axis and altitude y-axis, so the frequency of that occurring. So the first thing you can notice from this is that the model generally seems to have more spread aloft than what the radar, what the radar sees. The other thing you notice is that HER is the only model that actually has an increase of the density and height, and this increases at about five and six kilometers. So we still have to look into what is actually causing that. I think it's a, might be some sort of MCS cycle that happens over the overnight hours, but just for pre preliminary check right now. The other thing is Thompson's scheme has this column of high reflectivity that's visible right here that is not present in all the other simulations. So that's another interesting fact that to look at. So if you actually take the difference from all these uh, CFADs from the radar, so now blue will show where the model underrepresents the frequency of reflectivity, and red is where the model overrepresents that. So you could actually see the model overrepresentation or wider spread here very easily with all the red in WSM6 going across 50 dBZ all the way to zero, while the radar is really contains less spread here. So interestingly for the Thompson, it's the reflectivity distributions are weaker below the melting level, or at the melting level, I should say. So it's weaker here while stronger aloft. So you have this stronger reflectivity, I guess, tail sticking up that you can look at. And lastly, the HER signal seems to be potentially offset. Again, I have to look into this more, but HER signal is pretty similar. However, it seems to be too intense, so that's something I have to look at in the future. If we look at the CFADs for 45 dBZ objects, these are all the objects that are the most intense that occurred through the domain. So generally, looking at this, we find that the frequency distributions are a lot similar than they were for 30 dBZ. The spread is much less, and they're more compact, just like the radar observations. Uh, this time, WSM6 has that column feature that Thompson had before. So again, something to look in the future. But if we analyze the very right side, so the higher intensities, we see that Thompson and her both contain the strongest objects that are, are missing in WSM6 and the reflectivity. <coughs> The other thing we could look at is actually looking at the slope. So right now, it looks like her and Thompson both matched the observations very well, and actually seems lined up. However, when you take the difference, so those highlighted green regions were where, where the CFDs were present before, they're actually offset. So the Thompson and her runs are actually too intense, both near the surface and aloft, which causes it an offset with that. And then, the yeah, the WSM6 schema has that significant difference in intensity between the radar. So the other thing we had to look at was comparing the Thompson schemes. So comparing the Thompson 3011 and 37, and then comparing the aerosolware scheme to non-aerosolware scheme. So first for the aerosolware scheme, subtracting the frequency from the non-aerosolware scheme. So looking at 5, 30, and 45 dBZ, so anywhere you see red is where the aerosol wear scheme had a higher frequency of reflectivity, and blue is where it had a lower. So the first thing I'm going to uh, point out is the differences are very minor, relatively minor. At 5 dBZ, you have reflectivity frequency differences of 1%, and then 2% at 30, and 4% at 45. So these are really relatively minor to all the issues with, fo other, with forecasts. But there is some sort of consistent pattern. The aerosol wear scheme contains higher reflectivity or higher frequency of increased reflectivity values near the surface and aloft at 5 dBZ, denoted by this red tail right here, which is lower in the non-air solvator scheme. Uh, 30 dBZ is a little more chaotic, but you could 
possibly draw the same conclusions or not. So that one's relatively indifferent. But then at 45 dBZ, you see the aerosol wear scheme is weaker, has lower, is weaker near the surface, but stronger convection aloft. So even though the Thompson non-aerosol wear scheme is strong near the surface, it has a higher slope, which we can't see because it's hiding here. But the aerosol wear scheme has much higher intensity, so this red sticking up aloft into the vertical. If you compare version 3.1 and 3.7, really there's, looking at the surface of two kilometers to the very bottom level, there's some pretty small differences, but if we look at the melting level, which is at three to four kilometers, we see that there's a much bigger difference in frequency of reflectivity objects at that point. So this could possibly, I think there were some bug fixes in Thompson and how he was generating his uh, stratiform scheme between versions a long time ago, I think version 3.1 and 3.3 which may see, speak to why there's a big gap. So this might be a separation between stratiform and convection that we're seeing here, as the stratiform region is not higher frequency. And at 45 dBZ, and what's at 30, the new Thompson scheme, or the new version of the Thompson scheme, convection is much more intense and, going, and deeper as well, with the blue figures. And if we do the same thing for WSM6, so it's 3.1 version minus 3.7. Everything is red where 3.1 has a higher frequency. So again, at the surface, there's no major changes, and at 30 and 45 dBZ, there's no differences at all, almost. So if you actually perform the analysis between 3.1 and 3.7, you'd find no differences at all at the surface. However, if you look aloft, there's some major differences aloft. So first thing I'll point out is 3.7, has much higher frequency of weaker reflectivity objects with height for, for WSM6. So with the old version had uh, between 40 and 45 aloft extending all the way to 12 kilometers for 45 dBZ and at 30 dBZ we see that same tail here which are pretty significant. So there's a reduction of intensity for WSM6 update. So just to so conclude briefly, uh, reflectivity can be a valuable yet very challenging metric to use. You, it gives you in information on a convective structure and vertical extent of systems, but there's a lot of processing challenges and limitations that exist in this. And there's no major differences found between the aerosol and non-aerosol layer scheme, which is very interesting for what we found for our region, but really it's something you kind of expect. Maybe you would expect the delay in generation precipitation, so, and not so much as change in objects. So that's something you could still look in the future. Uh, preliminary results from the HER and local simulations are comparable. No model outperforms the other, and no model just just, just awful against the other. So they're pretty comparable. Uh, there's minor changes between 301 and 37 near the surface, but definitely more significant changes aloft, which would have been missed if you just analyzed the lo low-level field. So it's important to check the 3D vertical structure as well. And in general, all forecasts still overpredict the number and intensity of objects. It's still an ongoing bias within simulations. So just for some future work, I want to mention that we're going to also look at areas of objects and ch actually split out the diurnal cycle and check hourly to see what the differences are before we put that in. So take any questions if anyone has any. OK, do we have any questions? Yep. So that uh, was a nice talk. I um, was curious, though, so you talked about the Thompson aerosol um, versus non-aerosol. Mm -hmm. And did you notice, did you have a chance to look at what types of aerosol concentrations it was predicting in no, the simulations? That, yeah, that's also on the list to look into. Cause be, so if we go up a little bit here. Yeah, so especially the differences at 45 dZ aloft, I'd be interested to see what the differences were to cause those changes. But yeah, that's something that yeah. we look into. Okay. So this was shallow convection. Did you have any ice uh, in there? Uh, for, th for these, it was all types of convection. It was just shallow convection for the sensitivity study we had before. OK, so for the aerosol aware, did you use the same ice microphysics scheme for the Thomson aerosol aware and the Thomson? Or did you use the ion nucleation part in aerosol? No, it was the same one. Okay. Yep. Make sure to check that. 
So to compute reflectivity in the different schemes, do you use different reflectivity algorithms to convert I was, from your mass? I was anticipating that question. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually something that uh, Gretchen, my advisor, and I had a lot of discussion about. How do you calculate simulated reflectivity in the model from just mass? So that's an ongoing challenge. So what we actually, so first we actually used was the the Stolinga method, which is the same method that's in RIP4 and I believe NCL. So we did that because we had 311, which didn't have the do rate RF function. But here's just an image comparing the, the differences that I looked at. This is a, one example. So on the top we have two kilometer, five kilometer, and nine and a, nine and a half kilometer simulator reflectivity field, and this is computing computed using RIP, the method we used. On the bottom was the do rate RF method method in WARF that's supposed to be specific to each microphysical scheme. So I mean. If you look at just two kilometers alone, just the two different simulated reflectivity calculations show a massive difference, especially in terms of area. Actually, surprisingly, at five kilometers, they're not that much different. They're, they're, they're pretty similar, with the convective proportions here being more intense to rate RF. But the real difference is at nine and a half kilometers, which makes a significant, obviously, a, a bias, you could say. So, which method is correct? Well, you're, the do rate, RF, do rate RF method in WARF is supposed to be microphysically specific, so you're assuming that's more correct. But actually, I'm not too familiar with it, so I can't speak on that. However, we did take a, just one vertical cross-section across that storm, so across the storm to the north right here. And this kind of shows the biases of both methods pretty well. So the do rate RF method is on the bottom, so both have a pretty strong bright band inside the convective cell. But aside from that, the anvil region of the RIP4 method is a lot stronger. However, in the Durator Ref method, we found this really interesting separation between the stratiform and the snow that's supposed to be producing it. This is directly from the model. So it's, yeah. So those are the same cross sections? Same exact cross se section across the storm. The at the surface. Yep, so it's actually, yeah, it, it's right, yep, right, right through this region. So maybe I just skirted the, like I said, this is the first cross section I took. So maybe I just skirted the stratiform region, but either way, like that separation is interesting to know. So this just highlights issues with using simulator reflectivity. But it's if we could get mixing ratios from the radar, that'd be great. But that's a whole other <laughs> as well. So yeah, if anyone has anything to add to that, because that's a interesting ongoing problem. But we are planning to do the same analysis with uh, the do rate RF method and just compare the two and see how different they would be. So, You, you have a lot of plans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? So I, I wanted to say that I, I found this talk to be very interesting. Um, I know that in the MET development team we've talked about many times whether it's worth taking mode to three dimensions. Um, we're, we're doing mode time domain. Um, should we do mode three dimensions? And I think that this um, gives a good example of why we should um, start considering doing mode in three dimensions, because there are three-dimensional data sets out there that um, it would be nice to be able to take advantage of. So, And I really enjoyed um, how you put the, um, the visualization together. I think that it, it was very nice to be able to see what was going on through the, the whole um, vertical structure of the storm. So. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your presentation, and I guess we're d done early. Thank you.